Hello, teachers. Welcome to Jefferson Lab's annual teacher night. We are thrilled that you are joining us at our first virtual teacher night. My name is Carol McKisson. I am the high school program coordinator at Jefferson Lab and the lead for Jefferson Science Activities for Teachers for fifth grade, also affectionately known as JSAT. I now have the pleasure of introducing the director of Jefferson Lab, Dr. Stuart Henderson. Stuart has been the director of Jefferson Lab since 2017 and is an internationally recognized particle accelerator scientist. After receiving his PhD from Yale University and a postdoc fellowship at Harvard, Stuart has spent his career involved in collider and accelerator research. Welcome to Teacher Night, Stuart. Thanks so much, Carol. I really appreciate that introduction and um, really excited to be able to welcome all of you to this teacher night at Jefferson Lab. Um, very much looking forward to being able to do this in person uh, next year, but so happy that we're able to join in large numbers. I see we have 89 uh, attendees. That's fantastic for this virtual teacher's night at, uh, at Jefferson Lab. Real, really excited about the program that uh, we've organized for you all and can't wait to jump into it. But I thought I would take a couple of minutes right up front and just tell you a little bit about our lab and uh, maybe try to draw that connection between the incredible work that you all do and uh, the great science that we're doing here at, at Jefferson Lab day in and day out. So Virginia's very fortunate to have one of only 17 U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories. It's an incredible resource. Um, we're very lucky that Virginia hosts one of these uh, one of these labs. And um, the the National Lab System is a really uh, amazing resource for for the country. And it itself employs upwards of a hundred thousand people in science of one form or another, day in and day out. There's hardly any field uh, of science that isn't covered uh, by one of the national labs. And it's really the strength of that lab system that makes it so powerful. So what do we do right here at Jefferson Lab? We focus day in and day out on basic fundamental uh, science of the atomic nucleus. What is the nucleus made of? How does it work? How do the individual parts come together to form uh, all the properties of elements in the periodic table? Uh, more, even more deeply than that, what are protons themselves made up and what are neutrons made up of? So we've learned over the last half a century that protons and neutrons are made up of subatomic particles called quarks. And we study those in great detail at Jefferson Lab. And uh, we are able to do that because we have built and operate and use every day one of the world's most powerful electron microscopes for peering into the internal workings of protons and neutrons to actually look at the individual quarks that make up protons, neutrons, nuclei, the atomic nucleus of, of all the elements. And it's uh, basic science at the frontier of our understanding. We're doing this because we don't understand the answers to many of these questions. We don't have a great understanding of how the force that brings quarks together to form protons and neutrons, how it works at the most fundamental level. So we've had to, over the years, design and build an incredible facility that is centered around a high energy particle accelerator. You can see the rough outlines of that at the top of this map. It's the racetrack shaped uh, particle accelerator that creates a beam of electrons and accelerates that beam to 12 billion electron volts of energy. And then we fire that beam at targets that contain atomic nuclei. And we, we look at how the electrons bounce off of those individual quarks and record the uh, spray of particles that result. And from that, we analyze what happens inside uh, a proton or a neutron and how the quarks themselves are, are interacting. 
So it's basic fundamental science really at the most at the most basic level. We also have very large armies of uh, engineers who design this very specialized equipment, both the accelerators that produce the particle beams and the detectors that detect the uh, interactions between those electron beams and atomic nuclei. Computer scientists who analyze this data and try to make sense of it, um, as well as very large numbers of technicians who really uh, uh, enable the entire facility to work and to operate. So because we're so unique, we are home to the world's largest collection of nuclear physicists. So there are about 1,700 nuclear physicists from around the world who travel from uh, more than about uh, 40 countries to come to Jefferson Lab every year to carry out their experiments. So we're really just a, a beehive of activity in this, in this field of basic fundamental um, nuclear physics. We have a lot of exciting uh, experiments and projects that are ahead of us as a laboratory and uh, are, are really uh, eager to move those forward. And to move those forward, of course, we need new scientists and engineers entering all the time. And that's really where you all come in. And I'm just so in awe of what you do each and every day. Um, I know the importance that um, teachers had in my own education, my own decision to become a scientist, and the importance of really nurturing uh, students. When you see that spark go off and you see that, that real spark of interest in science, so I just am, am very appreciative of uh, the hard work that you all do in, in educating our, our students, because here at Jefferson Lab, we're, we're counting on those students you're educating now to come to the lab to uh, help us discover new things as engineers and, and scientists in the future. So um, because of that, we do have a very uh, strong program and a keen interest in education. It's, it's a value that we see you know, day in and day out here at Jefferson Lab. So we're so excited to be able to host this event and do our part to really help uh, in any way we can uh, benefit our community from this tremendous resource, this tremendous national lab that is sitting right here in our, in our own backyards, literally. So with that, thank you very much. Welcome again and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Stuart. The Science Education Group greatly appreciates the support of you and your leadership team. We could not do this without you. All right. Tonight, we would like to learn more about you, our participants, and your teaching experiences. There are multiple ways to interact with us tonight. There's the chat function, which we encourage you to utilize for reflections and comments. And I already see that you are utilizing that, which is wonderful. We have the Q&A feature where you can post any questions that you have for the presenters. And finally, we also have polls which will be posted so we can learn a little bit more about you. And with that, let's post our first poll. Which grade level do you teach? All right, I see most of you teach fifth grade with a eighth grade as a close second. Our hope is that you'll find something to use with your students tonight. Joining us tonight behind the scenes are my outstanding science education teammates. Lisa Searles Law, our team lead, the undergraduate program coordinator, and JSET eighth grade lead. Steve Gagnon, our webmaster extraordinaire and co-star of Frostbite Theater. Rhonda Bell, our outreach program coordinator and lead for JSAT sixth grade. And last, but certainly not least, Jalen Dio, our undergraduate intern who we rely on for just about everything. Again, please enjoy using the chat feature for chatting, but if you have a specific question, please put it in the Q&A. Are you guys ready for another poll? How are you teaching, remote, 
hybrid or in person? I see that the majority of you are teaching hybrid. Uh, whether you're teaching hybrid, remote, or in person, we have many resources to share with you tonight. Teacher Night was developed as part of the JSAP program, Jefferson Science Activities for Teachers. The JSAP program is intended for fifth, sixth, and eighth grade physical science teachers interested in a hands-on approach to teaching science. This program is generously supported by the Jefferson Lab Science Associates Initiative Fund. The structure for tonight's program includes pre-recorded demonstrations presented by our very own JSAT teachers who are currently available in the Q&A to answer any questions you may have. All the activities presented tonight are available on our website in addition to more than 50 science activities provided by our JSAT teachers. Finally, we also have lots of door prizes that you are eligible to win. Later in tonight's event, we'll give you some instructions on registering for those door prizes. We owe a big shout out to the instructors of the JSAP program. It truly would not be possible without them. The fifth grade JSAT instructors are Jennifer Grimm and Caitlin Leitner. The sixth grade instructors are Aaron Watson and Aaron Little. And the instructors for eighth grade JSAT are Tanya Bates and Missy Brahacek. If you have any questions following each of these demonstrations, the teachers are available in the Q&A to respond. If we are unable to answer all of your questions tonight, they will be posted with the answers on our website. Our first demonstration is presented by Alan McKee, who teaches sixth grade at Indian River Middle School. Alan will show us a delicious way to use common ingredients in your kitchen to investigate chemical and physical changes with a chocolate chip cookie demo, which correlates with SOL objectives 6.1 and 6.6. .6. Hello all, welcome to Teacher Night, and this is the science of the chocolate chip cookie. Here we have the ingredients for the first type of cookie we're going to make, the thin and crispy cookie. We have regular all-purpose flour, salt, baking soda, vanilla, brown sugar, white sugar, one egg, some milk, and of course, butter. And it wouldn't be a chocolate chip cookie without the chocolate chips. Then we're going to go to the chewy cookie, which has some of the same ingredients. We've got bread flour, we've got salt, baking soda, we've got one egg plus the yolk of a second egg, some more whole milk, sugar, vanilla, there's our chocolate chips and brown sugar. In the back, you're gonna notice parchment paper. If you haven't discovered parchment paper yet, when you bake, you need to do that. This stuff is magic. And the butter for this is in the glass dish here, the Pyrex, because it needs to be melted. So that is gonna be one part of what we're doing. Okay, first you need to sift the flour and baking soda and salt together. Set that off to the side. Take the cold butter the white sugar and the brown sugar and put them in the blender and let that thing do its magic and get it all mixed up. After you're done, do the, done doing that, then you add the other wet ingredients, the vanilla, the milk, and the whole egg and get that all mixed up nice and good. When you get to the part where you're adding in the flour, do it slowly, a little bit at a time, because if you don't, you're gonna end up with a huge mess. So start slow, speed it up, add them in a little bit, and then at the end, put in your chocolate chip cookies, Put them on the trays so that they're ready to go. These are the thin and crispy ones about to go into the oven. Okay, so the thin and crispy cookies are complete. The chewy cookies are all mixed up and ready to go in. We'll discuss the differences between the two in a bit. Okay, so here we are with the finished product. This is your thin and crispy cookie. It is quite thin. It's got a nice crisp on it. It's still a little warm, so it's kind of um, gooey in the middle. And then we've got the chocolate chip cookie that's the chewy one. 
This one's going to stay that way um, even after it cools completely. Now, there are a lot of things you can talk about when doing this lesson. Um, you can talk about the difference between physical and chemical change. When you have the butter in the one that's solid and the other one is melted, if the melted butter is allowed to re-solidify, it'll be butter the way it was again. And you have a mixture as well as a compound in here. Because you look at the chocolate chips, they're not the same distribution through all of them, so that makes it a bit of a mixture. But when you take the baking soda, the proteins from the eggs, the oils from the butter, and you put all of that together, it makes the compound, which is the cookie, which you could not take apart even if you tried. The um, chocolate chips, obviously, you could pick those out if you didn't want to, but why would anyone do that? That makes no sense. Okay, um, so typically, when we do experiments, we like to only have one variable. Well, when you're doing something with baking, sometimes you have several different variables. We had different amounts of egg, we had different types of sugar, different amounts of them, the butter was melted in some, it was solid in others. So you've got an opportunity to talk about how the scientific method is different depending on what you're doing. Also, when we talk about observations in science, normally we're only talking about our sight, maybe the smell a little bit, the hear, you can hear some things with it, the feel, the texture. This is one of the few um, experiments where you can actually taste and use all five senses to work on it. And um, I'd like to give a shout out to Alton Brown, whose idea this came from, from his show, Good Eats, the Chocolate Chip Cookie Caper. Anyway, try this with your students. I find that it works as a good um, extra activity for those who want something challenging to do, something at home that their parents are willing to work with them on. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, Alan for that mouth-watering demonstration. Please you put cut out the best part. You, oh. you cut out the best part. Hey, Alan. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead and tell us what the best part is. Well, the best part was the joke at the end. A good parent lets you, eat, lets you lick the beaters. A great parent turns them off first. <laughs> yes. I would post my laugh, my funny face on there, but I can't find it right now. Um, <laughs> we we have a question in the chat, I believe. All right. And Alan, um, the question is, have you done this in class? We have not done it in class. We have done it with a science club after school because at that point we had access to our teen living, AKA home ec lab, so we could actually do it then. Um, so it was a small group activity with a select group of students. I have assigned it um, as an extra credit activity um, during the pandemic so that students could do that. They could show their own videos and, and make their own experiments with it. So it did have some good uses, not only just as a demonstration. Good to know. That was, a, that was great. Thank you, Alan. Are there any other questions? For Alan, since we have him. Okay, let's Good. see. I have one. I have one here before you go, Alan. What type of chocolate chips work best? Does it matter what kind you have to use? Uh, it basically boils down to a personal preference. Um, I prefer something more along the lines of the Ghirardelli, um, things that are the, the higher quality chocolate. I just find that they taste better and they stand up to the heat a little bit more so you can get more of a cook, you can get more chocolate flavor in it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. All and right. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Sandy Thank also mentions that she did a similar thing with her high school students, but they came up with their own recipes. That would be good. <laughs> Sixth grade, that might be a little asking a little much. But high school, I get it. <laughs> right, right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Alan. Okay. Our second demonstration is presented by Angela Williams. 
who teaches eighth grade at Smithfield Middle School. Angela developed an in-person and virtual mini lab that students can conduct to identify elements, compounds, and mixtures. This mini lab correlates with SOL objectives PS3, A, B, and C. And remember, if you have any questions for Angela, please put them in the Q&A. Hi, my name is Mrs. Williams and I teach at Smithville Middle School. I teach eighth grade physical science. I have been in the JSAT program since 2011 and it's a great program. Today, I'm gonna to go over a mini lab that we've done in JSAT. I'm going to do a virtual version and also an in-class version. So the first version I wanna show you is my in-class version. And this is a mini lab. It's a great for an introduction to elements, compounds and mixture or for maybe a review. It's about 10 minutes long. And these are the materials that you're gonna to need to create this lab. And here's the lab set up. So you need thyme Petri dishes and you've got elements, compounds and mixtures and there's three of each. And when you finish, this is what it looks like. Now you can label them anything you would like. These are the letters that I chose. And the top picture is a how I store this lab. Now, if you were in class, I would scatter these dishes all throughout the room and they would go look at each of the dishes. They have to decide if it's an element, compound, or mixture. And this is a lab write-up that you have. In picture A, B, and C, they just draw a diagram of element, compound, and mixture. And at the bottom, they fill in element, compound, and mixture. It really is a great lab and it's super easy. Now, we also have a virtual element, compound, and mixture mini lab. So this is a drag and drop. So I found for my virtual students that drag and drop is a little more interactive and they really enjoy this. So the first one is it drag and drop element compound and mixture. And then here's some more pictures of an element compound and mixture, they drag and drop. And then again, some more pictures, black and white pictures. Another element compound and mixture. Now we're gonna do mixtures of elements, mixtures of compounds and mixtures of elements and compounds. And they drag and drop those also. Now this is the part of the in-class lab. I took pictures of what I did and this is the virtual part. So then they have to drag and drop which one of these looks like an element. So obviously B would be an element because they're all the same. And next one be a compound two or more, so that would be W, and then obviously mixture would be D. And so these are all the Petri dishes that I would do my normal in class. I took pictures of them and it's a drag and drop. And continue, and then these are questions for element, compound, and mixture, definitions, what are they made up of, drag and drop again. And here is a periodic table of elements. This is to answer these questions. So this, this lab is a little more detailed than my in-class mini lab. Um, it has more questions. They can get more in depth with this one. And here they decide if it's an element, compound, and mixture based on the elements. And here's examples of an element, compound, and mixture, drag and drop. Again, here's some more examples. And then the last slide is some questions that they need to answer about elements, compounds, and mixtures. And then I have the element answer key. So after we do the lab virtually, we go over the answer key and they check their work. Obviously element compound and mixture, the drag and drop examples, the mixture of elements, mixture of compounds, mixture of elements and compounds. And then of course the Petri dishes, which is like the in-class version, elements, compounds and mixtures. And then of course the element compound and mixtures explanations, definitions, and answers to again, element compound and mixture. So this is a great lab. Again, the virtual one goes a little more in depth than my in-class version, but both of them are awesome and you can use them in your class. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you learned something. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Angela for sharing the nuts and bolts of your demonstration. There are questions in the Q&A for Angela. So let's see here. Um, welcome, Angela. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I hear your dog. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm you know, everything it's, 
that is okay. You know, we are so used to that now. Um, let's see, Angela, what tends to be the most challenging aspect of this activity for your students? Um, probably um, sorting the the compounds and mixtures into the different categories like the, you know, H2O and all that. That's probably the most difficult. Otherwise, it's a pretty easy lab um, that anybody could do. Okay, good. And another question. Will these slides be available to participants? The answer is yes, definitely. Um, on our website, which we will talk about uh, later on in our program tonight. Uh, let's see, Angela, what program did you use for the drag and drop? Um, just Google Slides. Super okay, easy. To, yeah, see. super easy to do on Google Slides. Anybody can make those. Okay, let's see. What would you do if you wanted to discuss what is a substance solution or colloid, colloid in this lab too? You could, I, you could go more. So for th for that lab, it's um, it goes across for like just the basic stuff. It's not for like gifted students or, but you could add on at the end of it if you wanted to go more in detail with that information. Yes, you could extend your lesson for sure. Um, let's see. We have two more questions. How did you? How did the student answers? How did the students answer in the online version? Oh, so how did on, you see? How how did you see the student answers? Well, we use Canvas in Isle of Wight County, and they submit through Canvas, and then I can see their answers. They submit the assignment. Okay, Canvas. Yes. Um, oh, let's see. Great visual representations of EC and M. Uh, what is the time frame for the lab? For the um, in-person lab, about 10 minutes or less. It's a pretty short lab. But the online version would definitely be probably, uh, they do that on their own. Then we go back and check it. So maybe it takes them 15, 20 minutes, maybe. All right, Angela, we appreciate so much that you um, are here and we can see you and talk to you. Uh, great questions, you guys. Keep them coming. I love this. Thank you so much, Angela. All right. Thank you. Oh, door prize time. And now Jalen will talk about door prize opportunities. Hey everyone, good evening. Tonight we have some door prizes available for you to win for use in your classroom. Free stuff! Woohoo! <laughs> you can see a list of the prizes on this slide. And so, at this point in our presentation, we would love to take a five minute break for you just to get up, stretch, and possibly even fill out your door prize registration. Huh? <laughs> so, we will reconvene at 6.35. As before, any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A. We love hearing from teachers. Okay, next, we have a presentation by Alexis Tharp, who teaches sixth grade at Phoenix pre-K through eight school. Alexis will demonstrate how students can make a scale model of the solar system at home by using Play-Doh and other common materials. This activity correlates with SOL objective 6.2A, B, and C. Hi, my name is Alexis Tharp, and I'm a sixth grade science teacher at George P. Phoenix Pre-K-8 School in Hampton, Virginia. Today I'm going to show you an activity that you can do at home using Play-Doh to demonstrate the scale model of the solar system. First, you'll need three pounds of Play-Doh, a centimeter ruler, Dental floss or strong string will work. A butter knife, you can use a plastic one. A sharpened pencil. And index cards with the planet's names. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and don't forget Pluto, the dwarf planet. 
Start by dumping your Play-Doh out onto a clean surface and rolling it into a 30 centimeter cylinder. Using your floss, divide your cylinder into 10 equal sections. Place a mark every three centimeters at three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, and 27 centimeter marks. Count out six sections and cut the Play-Doh using your floss. Do not touch the other four sections yet. Roll the six sections into a ball and place it onto your index card labeled Jupiter. Use your floss to cut off three of the remaining four sections. With the remaining section, roll it into a 10 centimeter long cylinder. Use your floss to mark 10 even sections, about one centimeter each. Cut the cylinder in half so that you have two equal sections of five centimeters. Add five of the sections to Saturn and roll it into a ball. Cut off two of the remaining five sections and roll it into Uranus. Cut two sections from the remaining three sections and roll it into Neptune. Roll the remaining section into a small cylinder five centimeters long. Use the floss to mark 10 even sections, about a half a centimeter each. Use your floss to cut off a single section from the end of your cylinder. Roll the other nine sections into a ball and add them to Saturn. Take your remaining one section of Play-Doh and roll it into a two centimeter long cylinder. Divide that cylinder in half. One half will become Earth. Roll the other half of the Play-Doh into a five centimeter long cylinder. Use the string to mark 10 sections at half a centimeter each. Take nine of your 10 sections and roll them into Venus. With your remaining 10th section, roll it into a five centimeter long snake. Cut off a half a centimeter from the end and place it aside.
roll the larger of the piece of the Play-Doh into a ball and place it on the index card labeled Mars. Take the remaining tiny piece and do your best to roll it into a two centimeter snake. Very carefully use the point of your pencil to cut off two millimeters of Play-Doh. Roll the larger remaining piece of Play-Doh into a tiny ball and place it onto the index card labeled Mercury. The last little crumb of Play-Doh is the dwarf planet Pluto. So now the scale model of your solar system is done. Notice how your inner planets are very, very small and your outer planets, minus Pluto, are very, very large. So how big would the sun be on this model? If you started off with three pounds of Play-Doh for your planets, it would take 980 pounds of Play-Doh just to make the sun. It would be a meter in diameter. Alexis, wow. Thank you for the mini movie. It was out of this world. Um, does anybody, I almost said boys and girls, teachers, uh, please put your questions in the chat for Alexis if you have any. Oh, I see one here from Lisa. Is this typically done in teams or small groups? Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see me okay. I hope you can. Um, for me, I normally do it in groups of four, um, depending on how much Play-Doh. The very first year I tried it, we actually were able to do it in groups of two because I made um, the homemade Play-Doh, the, the salt um, flour Play-Doh. So I had enough that we could actually do it with groups of two and everyone got their, their side of the table, so to speak. But when we did it with Play-Doh, which got a little bit more expensive, we did it in groups of four. Good to know. Any other questions? So what I would do if I taught this is I would have your video playing, Alexis, and I would pause it and let and let the students kind of follow along with you because that was hard to beat. All right, let's see. Um, our final presentation or demonstration tonight is presented by Carla Barrier, who teaches fifth grade at Palmer Elementary School. Carla will demonstrate how to make rechargeable glow sticks that can be used for a variety of lessons in the classroom, such as chemistry, UV light, or scientific investigation. The science of glow sticks correlates with SOL objectives 5.1 and 5.3 A, B, C, and D. Hi there, my name is Carla Barrier and I teach fifth grade science at Palmer Elementary School. Today I'm going to do an activity um, for you all that I have done with a few students and I did it online. It's creating glow sticks and they're reusable. So they're not like the glow sticks that you buy in the store that you have to um, discard once they run out of their glow. The only thing you would need is a black light or some UV light to recharge them. So rechargeable um, glow sticks. So what I have here is I have some oil. You'll need about two teaspoons per, um, per color you do. And then I have a, a strontium illuminate. And I was so excited. I got this through JLab. And it's also known like art and glow. Then there's some that I got so excited I ordered extras and different ones. So I've ordered a couple different packs. This one is five color glow, glow powder. Um, but anyway, so you can just kind of look at the different colors and choose what you'd like. So I also am using these little cups I bought at the Dollar Tree just because I think it's easier to mix the oil. I found that these tubes work better. I've seen some... Um, YouTube videos and the YouTube videos have where you can use a straw and melt an end, but I did that and I had stuff everywhere. So 
These are really um, pretty good. JLab gave us one and I ordered some um, on Amazon. And so they have a little top. And then it's easiest if you use a syringe. So the first thing you need to do is put about two teaspoons of oil and I'm gonna share my other camera and I'm gonna make four different colors. So about two teaspoons of oil in each cup. So, and again, I just am gonna make four different colors, but if you're only gonna make one color, you only need one amount. All right, so, and I will reuse that syringe in just a second. The second step to making the glow stick is using the colors that you would like to use. So and you need about a half a teaspoon of the strontium illuminate. So this pink is real pretty. So I'm going to go ahead and put the pink in one of the cups. And again, about a half a teaspoon. Um, sky blue is probably pretty. I got so excited when I did this at home. And then I was like, oh, I want more colors. Okay, so that's our sky blue. I'll put it behind it. And why not a green? Teachers, please get ready for bus one. Teachers, please get ready for bus one. Green and let's do an aqua. Aqua sounds pretty. And I found that because you need to dissolve the powder in each one. I have found if you stir it with the other side of the spoon, it works pretty well. but you wanna really mix it. And I'm gonna pause the video so I don't, we don't have minutes and minutes of me mixing, but I'm gonna mix and then I will put the video back. Okay, so I've been mixing the four different colors that I just chose, but again, you could just do one color if you'd like. I just, I'm kind of adventurous sometimes, so I have four that I've started. And again, just mixing it to make sure I'm gonna go ahead and share my desk. So this way you can see. So then with the syringe, I'm going to take some out and I'm gonna put it inside my little test tube. And do the same thing with the others. very similar. I'm going to put them under the black light in just a couple minutes. One of the other ones is aqua and then sky blue. Both of those are very light. All right, so let's do our green. And this one's quite fluorescent looking. And last but not least is our pink. Mm. 
and I have extra so I could make more of each of the colors. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video because I'm gonna put it under black a black light. So I have a black light that I'm gonna be putting it under and then I'll share with you. All right, I wanted to show you before I put it under the black light. So here are the four vials and I have a black light right here. So I'm just going to let it charge for about five minutes and then I will show you our results. Well, you can already tell the green is starting to get really bright, even the others. So stay tuned so you can see in just a couple of minutes how well this will work for our glow stick. So stay tuned. So I've been charging my glow sticks for probably about four or five minutes with the black light. And I turned the light off in my room so you could easily see it, but it's glowing. Here's the aqua. Here's the sky blue. And here's our orange, or I'm sorry, yep, orange. So a fun activity, it's cool because it can be recharged. All you need is some UV light. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I was so excited the first time that I saw this, that we did it with JLab, that I was like, I need more colors and I want to try this. So anyways, thank you for watching the video and enjoy making glow sticks. Thank you, Carla, for that enlightening demonstration. Uh, let's check for any questions. Okay, did you do you just get the materials from Amazon? Well, I um, I did get some from JSAT, and um, Carol even gave me more when she heard that I was doing the demonstration. But like I said in the video, I got so excited. I ordered it on Amazon and then ordered another set because I wanted more colors. Um, the test tubes, we had gotten one through JSAT and I, I did try it with the straw. I did some YouTube videos and I just leaked everywhere. So I ordered a pack of um, probably about, I don't know, 15 or so. So these are the ones that I ordered. Um, because I wanna do it in the classroom with the kids, especially next year. I'm thinking like in small group. But it goes a long way. So that's what I did. And then um, I did it with like small little glass cups at home. And I just felt like the little red small solo cups and I could throw it away and I didn't have to worry about the oil and all that. But here are some others that I purchased and I even have a couple more little bags of just various colors because I love glow sticks as a child and around Halloween and stuff. So I thought, what what fun could that be? So I did do it with them. Um, I had a play date of a couple fifth grade um, kids over at my house and we did it together and they just really enjoyed it so great and I remember giving you that extra powder and you know an envelope of powder lasts uh, they can make many glow sticks one envelope so um, that's a good thing okay let's see what size are the tubes do you remember how many um, milliliters I know is? no they're pretty small. I mean, I used the syringe and had extras, and I filled the syringe about halfway. Um, so it doesn't take a whole lot. I could have made, probably with what I used in each cup, I probably could have made two to three, um, most likely two um, per color. Yeah, okay, yes. And so I just have another question for you, Carla. Did you buy the plastic tubes or the glass? The plastic, because I didn't okay. want them, I didn't, I didn't want it to be a hazard if they broke and so forth. So they're just plastic tubes. Um, I can't remember how much they cost, but they weren't very much at all. And right. um, like when the boys came over and did the activity here at my house, they I put them in a baggie just in case they leaked. And when I did the one in school, I still have those four test tubes. They haven't leaked, they're still on my desk. So I'm hoping to use them next year. Yep, and that leads right into our next question. How long will they last? Do they store over the summer and recharge next year? Yes, they, they will last a long time. And there's another that was one. The, I, I was going to say, that was the exciting part of it is that they lasted, and all you have to do is recharge them. 
Um, yes. Okay, let's see. This is probably going to be our last question before we have to move on in the interest of time. I noticed you did not have gloves or goggles. Is this something safe to use without protective gear? Yes, it's fairly safe. Um, I do have the hazardous safety um, sheets that are attached to my lesson. Um, but I, if I did it in the classroom, I would have kids wear um, goggles because one, I want to make sure we're safe, but also it's fun to, to goggles on and I would have them wear gloves as well and then wash their hands afterwards. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's not toxic at all. Um, so is there an assignment that went along with the lab, Carla? With an, um, as far as that, no, I was just testing it out because I was so excite, excited about it. But I would use it with um, scientific investigation. I also would do it with um, our light unit. Yes, that would be, that's exactly what I was thinking. Okay, thank you, Carla. Um, now we are moving on to um, Steve, who will give us an overview of our website where you can find additional resources and activities. Take it away, Steve. So, the website. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, the, the web address is education.jlab.org. Uh, so, this is our homepage. Uh, this is where you will find the high use items and the time sensitive items like JSAT application deadlines, download, teach night activities, that sort of stuff. Uh, what you're primarily concerned with, though, is that link to get the other activities from tonight. So we've had a few people present today. There are far more people in the program that we obviously couldn't fit into an hour. Everything that's available for downloading will be linked off the home page. The link to the downloads will exist on the website for a time. Eventually it's going to disappear, uh, not off the site, but off the home page. So if it's gone, you know, how do you find the thing, right? And, and that's what the links along the top of the page are for. So you might be thinking to yourself, hey, I'm a teacher. Maybe I hit the teacher link. And you know that would be a good guess. Right? You hit the teacher link, <clears throat> and that's going to bring up um, all the resources we have that we think are good for teachers. To get to the downloads from there, you would go to either the JSAP page or the Teacher Night page. But there, there's usually more than one way to get to the resources. Right? There are many ways to get from A to B. Um, so you could go through features, you could go through program, you could do a search, but searching is boring in general. Um, basically, though, if you take an educated guess, you'll, you'll get pretty much in the general area of where you want to be. So uh, let's talk about some of the resources that are on here. Uh, first is the table of elements. And in addition to the online table, uh, we have versions that you can download and print. And of course, clicking on an element will bring up information about that element. Uh, but we have more than that, though. Right? We have a bunch of games dealing with the element. We have Element Hangman. We have crossword puzzles. We have flashcards. We have Element Math, which displays a portion of the table of elements for the students and then asks them how many protons are in this, how many neutrons are in that. Um, if there was a way to make a game out of the elements, we tried it, even if it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, uh, of course, Life isn't just all fun and games, right? Sometimes the SOLs happen. And <laughs> um, we have a practice site with all the SOL questions that have been uh, released by the state. And you can select questions from a given topic. You can select strands from within a topic. So if you have, uh, if you like to review questions in eighth grade science that deal with force, motion, energy, and matter, you can do that, right? You can customize it down to the strand level. It's a good for general review, and it's also good uh, to see where students might be needing help with something, right? if they're not doing well on statistics problems, for instance. Uh, great, so we will go back to the home page, and you will also see a section called Science at Home Experiments. If you're not aware, we do have a, a, a video series called Frostbite Theater that's up on YouTube. These are short videos, either of standalone experiments or segments from live presentations, like our Physics Fest presentation. And the Science at Home videos are really just that. They were literally shot in my backyard. And they're intended as experiments that students can do at home using the equipment that we use in the video. 
So for example, there's one on density. And we determine the volume of the objects we're measuring with the volume displacement method. So we have graduated cylinders to show the students the before and after so they can determine the volume, right? So it's, it's not that much different what you would do in real life. It's just that they don't physically have the cylinders in their hands, but they are reading the initial level and the final level after you drop in the objects. Uh, so we're gonna give a little bit of the taste of these. Uh, a little bit of background on this video. This is an experiment using UV sensitive beads to determine which materials block UV light and which don't. We're coming in in the middle of this while I'm complaining about how the sun is going to mess up the experiment. So roll that beautiful bead footage. If we do this out here, the sun's ultraviolet light will change the beads as soon as we remove the materials. So with a snap of my fingers and through the magic of editing, we've moved everything inside. We'll cover the beads with a half gram each of SPF 4 sunscreen and SPF 45 sunblock. And with a lens that's supposed to be transparent to ultraviolet light. And a lens that's supposed to be opaque to ultraviolet light. A piece of cloth. And a piece of roofing shingle. We'll also have two sets of control beads. One set will be exposed to the ultraviolet light without any special covering. And the other set won't be exposed to the ultraviolet light at all. That way, we'll know what maximum exposure and zero exposure look like. We'll expose the beads to the ultraviolet light for two minutes. We won't torture you with the real-time footage of that, but this is a great place to pause the video if you want to come up with a hypothesis for which materials will block the UV light and which materials won't. Because we're going to show you the results in... Five... Four... Three... Two... One! Yeah, we're, we're not going to show you the results. Um, if you want to know how it actually happens or what the results actually are, uh, you'll have to watch the, the video online. Uh, but these Science at Home videos, they all have handouts that you can download and use with the students. Uh, these can be done individually by an individual student. And, and Excuse me. They can be done individually, asynchronously by individual students. Uh, or you can do it like in a classroom all at one time if you don't happen to have the, the equipment to do the experiment. Uh, so yeah, basically these are experiments that can be done without actually needing the equipment in order to do them. Are there any questions about any of this? Any questions? So hopefully you guys um, will visit our website. There's a lot of resources there for um, teachers. And Steve, thanks so much for sharing how to navigate through the website and showing us your be beautiful bead footage. Remember to check out our website and apply to the JSAP program. Uh, the application is available now on our website. We at Science Education would like to thank you all for attending Teacher Night. Don't go yet. And we hope to see your JSAP application. We hope that some of the activities presented tonight and the activities posted on our website will be useful to you in your classroom. Following the conclusion of our event, after Jalen announces the door prize winners, there will be a survey generated where you can let us know what worked for you for tonight's event, what didn't work for tonight's event, or just overall thoughts. So, please do not immediately log off or exit your browser. Jalen is now going to announce the door prize winners. Thank you so much, Carol. Okay, guys, it is the time that we have been waiting for. We are so excited and so thankful for all of you coming tonight. We hope that these um, activities are going to be useful for use in your classroom. And we really thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so without further ado, I will be posting these door prize winners if you can give me one moment to pull that up i will leave the screen up for a little bit so that you guys can see what you won <laughs> ring capture <laughs> okay this list will also be posted. Um, I will be using the mailing addresses that you guys have provided in your 
um, Google Form registration. Um, and again, thank you so much for attending. Please don't close your browser immediately. We would love to hear your feedback. After a slight delay, you will be provided with a link to that survey. Thank you again for attending tonight's event and for your dedication to engaging and inspiring our next generation of scientists and future leaders. Have a great evening, everyone, and take care. Goodbye. <laughs>